Greetings to you this blessed Sunday morning. And it's my delight again to bring to you a word from the Word of God. Uh, today I will be covering part B of the definition or explanation of what the world is. And I'm just going to start with a brief summary. We had started on a series that I was going to cover, which is the mark of the beast. And after the first presentation, I decided that before we actually go into looking at the worship of the beast, it was important for me to touch some three key things in our spirituality that affect us in our worship. Whether we worship God or we worship the beast. And these things were the three arch enemies of your spiritual life. And these three arch enemies, we had already covered the first one, which is flesh, which I say and prove from scripture that your greatest enemy from living your true spiritual life of being really holy is your flesh. You are your number one enemy. This body that you live in is your number one enemy in living the Christian life. And so we're going to the second one, which is the world. And uh, because it was a little long, I divided it into two parts. And then we did part A yesterday, and we are going to do part A today. And then we're also going to look at Satan. Who is he? How does he operate? And I've been working on this premise that if you really want to fight a war well, you need to know your enemy. You need to know who you're fighting against. And you need to know what is the strategy that the enemy uses as he fights. Otherwise, you are just going to be beating the air, wasting energy, not fighting as a true soldier. Uh, we had looked at several meanings of the word world yesterday. And I'm not going to go back to review everything. You can go back and look at part A of that message. For remembrance, or if you have not seen it, you can go and look at it and keep yourself up to date. Uh, but the brief summary that I'm going to give is that we said the world is the created order, the universe, the world of mankind in which we are. This is the world that Adam's disobedience brought sin. This is the world that Jesus came into to give himself up and to save. For God so loved the world that he sent his one and only son, that whosoever believes in him will not perish but have everlasting life. Another major meaning of world, as we saw in that last presentation, is it refers to kingdoms, empires, nations and their splendor and all their glory and then the systems that run this world the political system the economic system and it can be branched out into as many systems as possible but the political and the economic seems to uh, give a summary of all of them so that is what the world is up to that point. So today we are going to continue looking at the meaning of the world. And uh, the one we're going to start with this morning is that the world, that is everything that belongs to this existing framework of mankind called world, all that belongs to it, that appears as that which is hostile to God. That is, it is lost in sin, it is holy at art with anything divine, ruined and depraved. Now I'm going to read that again so you can understand as we begin to expand as we go ahead. So the world and everything that belongs to it appears to be that which is hostile to God, that which is holy at odds with him, in sin, ruined and depraved. I have several verses of scripture that would explain this. Some I will mention, 
Some of them I will read. And the first place that we are going to read is John chapter 8, verse 23. John chapter 8, verse 23. Jesus speaking to the people, and in the crowd there were a lot of religious people, you know? So I've been emphasizing this thing that I'm not trying to make you religious. I am trying to make you spiritual and truly and wholly devoted to God, who says, those who worship me must worship me in spirit and in truth. I think that the greatest trap for people today is religion. When you think that you have done some religious thing, you're baptized, you're confirmed, you go to church, you give, and therefore you are right with God. No, that does not make you right with God. In John 7, Jesus said that this is the work of God, that you believe in the one he has sent. And if you have truly believed, test your faith according to the Bible. Are you living according to the word of God? Are you truly born again? So Jesus was talking to the people here, and the crowd was made of a lot of religious people, a lot of theologians, well-learned people in the law. And then he said to them, he said, but he continued, you are from below. I am from above. I had preached a sermon at some point that covered that particular subject. If you can go back and search within my videos, you're going to see what exactly does it mean. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. You are from below. I am from above. You are of this world. I am not of this world. So there's two worlds in which you can belong or which you belong right now. Either you belong to this world, its sinful system and that feeds you, or you belong to the world that is above. In order to explain this sentence here, I will just take you around still to the, to, the, to, to the Bible. The Bible explains itself and is so interconnected that if I decide, I may not say anything, but just read verses to you and put them together to make a whole point. In Colossians 3, now we're trying to explain what does it mean to be from above? What does it mean to not be of this world? Colossians 3, 1 to 3, he says this. Since then you have been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Number one, or, or two things. You have been raised with Christ. You've been, you've believed in Christ. You've been born again. And symbolically, you have been baptized with him. So you have been raised with Christ. The Christ that says, I am from above. So if you have been raised with Christ, if you are to say the same that you are from above with Jesus, you have to set your heart on things above. Set your heart on things above, the things of God, wholly, completely, where Christ is seated at the right hand of God. Again, set your minds on things above not on earthly things. So you see the clear contrast here. A person who is from above, like with Jesus, a person that is not of this world, is the person who has believed Jesus and has been raised with him, that sets his heart on things above, that sets his mind on things above, not on earthly things. So if your mind is set on earthly things, then you are of this world. You are not from above like with Jesus Christ. Colossians and no, Philippians 3 verse 19. What is the destiny of the people whose minds are on earthly things? Who are of the world? It says that their destiny is destruction. 
Their God is their stomach. If you're embroiled in this economic system and all you think about is how much you will earn, how much you will eat, how much you will wear, you belong to the world. You don't belong to God. And your destiny is what? Destruction. Your God is your stomach. And your glory is your shame. And then he clearly defines it. Their mind is on earthly things. You see the contrast just like with Colossians 3 here. Set your hearts on things above. Set your minds on things above, not on earthly things. Because if you set your mind on earthly things, your God is your stomach. Your destiny is destruction. It's simple. It's straightforward. That is the word of God. So in John 12, we continue to see the contrast here of this world. In John 12, John 12, verse 25. He says, The man who loves me, the man who loves his life, will lose it. While the man who hates his life in this world, will keep it for eternal life. The man who loves his life will lose it. But the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. I go over to John, 30, uh, John 12, 31, the first uh, A. He says this, but, but I, when I am lifted up from the earth, I will draw all men to myself. Oh, then that was 32. Let's go back to 31. John 12, 31, just the first part. He says, now this is time for judgment on this world. Now the prince of this world is being driven out. Now, actually speaking, those verses of scripture are being fulfilled right now as I speak. It is time for judgment for this world. And that the prince of this world will be driven out. Revelation 12, Satan is cast out of heaven and he comes down to earth. And then there is chaos in the world, pandemics. Floods and this and this and this and this. So we're looking at the world as it appears as hostile to God, lost in sin, deprived of nothing divine, ruined. So this world which we're talking about now that you shouldn't belong to, like Jesus says, I am not of this world. This world is in exists in opposition to God. Let's go to 1 Corinthians. 1 Corinthians chapter 1 verse 21. This world as we see it is exists in opposition to God. 1 Corinthians 1 verse 21. It says this. For since the wisdom of God, the world through its wisdom did not know God. Did not know God. God was pleased through the foolishness of what was preached to save those who believe. Yes, I am grateful to God that you tune in and you are listening to this message. To most people, this preaching is foolishness. It's useless. You know, they have their philosophies. Whether it be psychology, psychiatry, uh, or philosophy proper, or even theology, evolution, evolution. They have all these philosophies, but through them, they do not know God. But God has chosen just this preaching that looks like foolishness. I know that most people listening to me will think that I am crazy. 
Why are you telling us not to enjoy this world? That's crazy. We can't stand that. But it says that God has chosen this preaching, which is foolishness, to save the world. Still there in 1 Corinthians 2 verse 12, it tells us this. We have not received the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God. You see the contrast. There's a spirit of the world and a spirit that is from God. That we may understand what God has freely given us. So you cannot understand what I'm saying. You cannot understand the Bible if you do not have the spirit of God. You have the spirit of the world. If I'm not making sense to you, it's because you do not have the spirit of God. You have the spirit of the world. And therefore you cannot understand spiritual things. Your mind is on earthly things, not on things above. In Psalms 2, we're reminded that, oh, it says, why do the nations conspire? Why do the nations rage? The kings of the earth, all of them, I told you yesterday that all the nations and all the presidencies and the prime ministries of this world are controlled by Satan. Don't be deceived. They've gathered themselves against the God of heaven and against his anointed one, against his Mashiach, his Messiah. Saying, come together, let's break the bonds. Let's live as we want. Do as thou wilt. Let's cast off this thing called the Bible. They pass laws and laws and laws that are anti-biblical. This is the world that's in opposition to God. And this world that is in opposition to God is condemned. 1 Corinthians 11, 32. 1 Corinthians 11 verse 32. What does it say? So then my brothers, when you came to get a, to eat, let me see. No, it's not that verse. But let's, let's move on. So this world is in opposition to God and it is condemned. It is condemned. We know it in John 3. Whoever does not believe in Jesus is condemned already because he has not believed in the one and only Son of God. And that light has come into the world, but people love darkness because their deeds are evil. They want to continue in darkness because if you do what is right, you come to the light. So everybody will know that what you're doing is true. So this world, as we have seen and have already mentioned, is that the devil is the ruler of this world. All of it. All the political system, all the economic system, all of it, the devil is the ruler. So when you understand these things, when we start talking about the worship of the beast, then you will understand why those things play together. Why it is said that the whole world is worshiping the beast. If you don't understand that Satan is the ruler of this world, that, that this world as it is, is under Satan, of, is, is, uh, Satan is the ruler of this world as it is, if you don't understand that, well, you may as well just close the book of Revelation, you will not understand it. But whether you understand it or not, the reality of the truth is coming. You cannot be on the fence. You either be of this world or not of it. You either have set your mind and heart on things above, or your mind and heart is on the things of this world that is leading to destruction. But this, so I ask the question here, how does the devil or Satan rule this world? And I give a hint here, Revelation 12 verse 9, you find that there. Then also, I have 2 Corinthians 11, 1 to 15. It's a long passage. So we're answering the question, how does the devil or Satan rule this world? You're going to be surprising what the answer would be here. The answer is simple. False doctrine. False apostles. False teachers of the gospel. 
Paul said, I hope you will put up with me a little, my bro uh, would, uh, put up with a little of my foolishness. You know, yeah, this is our preaching is foolishness to you who think you're wise. But you are already doing that. I am jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promise you to one husband, to Christ, so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. But I am afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. That's a mouthful. I'll read that verse 4 again. For if someone comes to you and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. Can't overemphasize that. Jesus says that just before he comes into this world, there will be a lot of false prophets. And we may not just con con concentrate on the emergence of false prophets. We also have to rem remember that even the church as a whole over the past 1,700 years has come on with very strange and paganic teachings in the church. Are you a pure virgin pledged to be married to Christ? The Bible tells us in 1 John 4 verse, 1 John 4 verse 1 that you must test the spirits to know whether they be of God. You must be careful not to hear another gospel other than the one that we preach. That Christ died and was buried and, was, and, and came back to life for the forgiveness of our sins and for our justification. He says, but, but I do think that I am the least inferior to those super apostles. I may not be trained, I may not be a trained speaker, but I do have knowledge. We have made this perfectly clear to you in every way. Was it sin for me to lower myself in order to elevate you by preaching the gospel of God to you free of charge? Free of charge. The gospel is being sold today for money, big time. I robbed other churches by receiving support from them so as to serve you. And when I was with you and needed something, I was not a burden to anyone. For the brothers who came from Macedonia supplied what I needed. I have kept myself from being a burden to you in any way and will continue to do so. All most of the false prophets today, including even churches, they feed on you. They feed on you. They don't follow the example of Paul here. As surely as the truth of Christ is in me, nobody in this region of Achaia will stop this boasting of mine. Why? Because I do not, because I do not love you. God knows I do. And I will keep on doing what I am doing in order to cut the ground from under those who want an opportunity to be considered equal with us in the things they boast about. Very critical. Paul says, I want to cut the ground from under them. Like they should go into a sinkhole. These false prophets and false teachers and false churches. He said, I want the ground from under them to be cut so that they should disappear from the earth. And then he says that critical statement in verse 13. For such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ. And no wonder, for Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. People, Satan is sitting in the church. Don't look outside. Don't look at Islam. Don't look at Hinduism. Satan is sitting in the Christian church. If you do not pay attention carefully to the word of God, you will not understand. Just wait until we go over 
and talk about Satan and how he deceives the whole world. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerades as servants of righteousness, their end will be what their actions deserve. False prophets, false churches, big time big denominations, not following the truth, false apostles. So, that is how Satan is deceiving the world, and that's just a tidbit. We're going to see more when we examine Satan, who he is, and how he is manifesting in the world. I know it was going to shock you, you know, because you've been deceived to think that, oh, Satan is this black figo with a pitchfork in his hand. No, Satan is an angel of light, the most beautiful creature, adorned, walking in broad daylight, but you don't know. But what I want you to understand like I was discussing with a sister yesterday, that she was trying to encourage a new believer. He says that the fight is hard, but you are fighting in victory, not fighting for victory, because the victory has been won. Jesus defeated Satan when he went to the cross 2,000 years ago. It is just a matter of time. And God has allowed Satan to continue to work in the world, to continue to work in the church, in order to prove you whether your devotion to him is sincere. And if your devotion to God is sincere, you will be able to distinguish between the false gospel, the false apostles, and the true gospel, and the true apostles of Christ. By the way, we don't have apostles today. Any apostle today is a false one. So the devil has already been, dis uh, uh, been, been defeated. So I say that this world that we are talking and trying to define here, this world that is hostile to God, it hates Jesus. And it hates anyone who believes in Jesus. Yes. This world hates Jesus. And it hates anyone who has believed in him. Let's look at John 7.7. 7. John 7.7. 7 says that the world cannot hate you, but it hates me because I testify that what it does is evil. If you stand against the evil of the world, you stand with Jesus, and the world will hate you. I can imagine how many enemies I've made by preaching the gospel straight and clear like this. John, Over to John 15. John 15, verses 18 to 21. John 15, 18 to 21. Jesus says, If the world hates you, believers, keep in mind it hated me first. If you belonged to the world, it would love you as its own. As it is, you do not belong to the world. Is that true of you as a believer in Jesus? You do not belong to the world, but I have chosen you out of the world. That is why the world hates you. And remember the words I spoke to you. No servant is greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will persecute you. If they obeyed my teaching, they will obey yours also. And they did not obey his teaching. So that's why those who preach truth today are very few. Very few. So you are hated because they will hate Jesus. And so the Bible goes ahead, and I'm just going to mention this briefly here. The Bible goes ahead to say, what should be the relationship of the believer to the world? We have already seen, set your heart and minds on things above, not on things on earth. For if you set your minds on things on earth, your God is your stomach, your mind is on earthly things, and you are heading to destruction. So as a believer, one who knows God, one who has set their mind and their heart on things above, this is how you should relate to the world. 
you should be dead or crucified to the world. That is sin. So if you are dead, you don't, you, you don't, you don't move. So when it comes to the life of the world, you are dead. You don't move at all. Because you're dead to the world. Crucified. Um, Paul says that I am crucified with Christ and I no longer live. The life I live, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and died for me. 2 Corinthians 5 verse 14 and, and 15 says that we thus judge that one died for all and that therefore all died. And they no, they no longer live for themselves, but they live for him who died for them and was raised again. So you're dead, dead or crucified to the world. You do not belong to the world. John 15, 19. Keep yourself unspotted or unpolluted by the world. James 1, 27. Do not be a friend of the world. No friendship with the world. I would like to read the verses with this. James 4, 1 to 4. James 4, 1 to 4. It says, What causes fights and quarrels among you? Don't they come from your desires that battle within you? You want something, but you don't get it. You kill and covet. But you cannot have what you want. You quarrel and fight. You do not have because you do not ask. When you ask, you do not receive because you ask with wrong motives that you may spend what you get on your pleasures. Number four, you adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Clear. Friendship with this world is equal to hatred towards God. Which therefore means if you are a friend of this world, you are not heading to God's kingdom. Because you cannot hate God and go into his kingdom. You adulterous people, don't you know that friendship with the world is hatred towards God? Anyone who chooses to be a friend of the world becomes an enemy of God. Very self-explanatory. You can read those verses over and over. James 4, 1 to 4, especially verse 4. You have to say no to the world and its desires. No to the world and its desires. So we're looking at the relationship of the believer to this world. Crucified, you don't belong to it. You must keep yourself unspotted by it. You must not be a friend of the world because a friend of the world means hatred towards God and therefore destruction. You have to say no to the world and its desires, which basically the desires of the flesh. So these three enemies work together. Titus 2 verses 11 to 12 says this. For the grace of God that brings salvation has appeared to all men. It teaches us to say no to ungodliness and to worldly passions and to live self-controlled, upright, and godly lives in this present world. While we wait for the blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our great God and Savior, Yeshua HaMashiach. Jesus the Christ, who gave himself up for us to redeem us from our wickedness and to purify for himself a people that are his very own, eager to do what's good. No, to worldly passions and its desires. You must overcome the world. You must overcome the world. You've been already you've already been given the provisions. First John. 5, 4 to 6. You've been given the provision, the grace of God, the Holy Spirit. We looked at it in the flesh. Romans 8, 13. If you live according to the sinful nature, you will die. But if by the Holy Spirit you crucify, you put to death the sinful desires of the body, you will live. For as many as are led by the Spirit of God are they the children of God. And He has given of His Spirit whereby we cry, 
Abba, Father. And it goes on to say there in Romans 8, that if we are sons, then we are heirs with Christ, co-heirs with Christ. We will inherit all that is Christ, which is all the world. The things you are running after that away from God, they are yours anyway. But you can't get to them until you go through denying them now, until the day of Christ. We must overcome this world. First John 5, 4-6. For everyone born of God overcomes the world. Everyone born of God. John 1, 12 to 13. Or oh, beginning from a little. Jesus came to his own people. His own did not receive him. But to those who received him, to those who believe in his name, he gave them the right to be called the children of God, who were born not of the will of man, not of the will of a husband, not the will of a... But we are born of God. So everyone who is born of God, who is born again, John 3, 3 and 5, Verily, verily, I say unto you, unless a man is born again, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. Unless a man is born of the spirit, water and of the spirit, he cannot enter the kingdom of God. And so anyone who is born again, who is born of the spirit of God, overcomes the world. He's not a friend of that world. He is not living in that world. He overcomes the world. He overcomes the flesh and all that the world offers, much of which we'll see again. He says, don't love the world because it will pass away. Now we're going to spend quite a bit of time on that passage. We've already seen that friendship with the world is hatred towards God. Then we have a critical command here in the book of 1 John, chapter 2. Do not love the world. Period. And it will explain to us what loving the world means. This current world is political system, is economic system, will all pass away. And most definitely very soon. So 1 John chapter 2, verse 15 to 17, says, Do not love the world or anything in the world. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If, any man, if anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Sounds much like James chapter 4, verse 4. Uh, verse four. Friendship with the world equals to hatred towards God. If you love the world, the love of the Father is not in you. You cannot mix those two together. You cannot serve God and material things. You cannot serve God and money. You cannot serve God and your flesh. It is impossible. For everything, I mean, everything, for everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, those fleshly desires for sex, for food, for material possessions, Cars, houses, clothes, shoes, all those things. For everything in the world, the cravings, that's the cravings of your flesh. That enemy of you, that arch enemy of yours, which is your flesh. Your flesh. The cravings of sinful man and the lust of his eyes. The lust of his eyes. I want to get that. I want to get that. Oh, I'll get that. Oh, that's great. I'll look great in that. This, 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 and that. The lust of the eyes. And the boasting of what he has and does. Boasting of what he has and does. You know exactly what you want in life. You know the things that Preoccupy your heart. Ugly things. They don't draw you closer to God. It says that, so it's for everything in the world, 
the cravings of sinful men, and the lust of his eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. It comes not from the Father, but from the world. You want to know why Satan is ruling the whole world? You want to know why the whole world is worshipping Satan? Because y'all love the world. And who is in control of that world? Satan. It begins to make sense. How, why, why, why will the whole world be worshipping Satan? Because of this, you love the world. And Satan is in control of the world. He's in control of the things you get. You want to migrate to the best economy in the world. So you can have a nice job and earn more money. But that economy is controlled by Satan. Yeah. Does it ever wonder to you why Jesus asked the question, When the Son of Man comes back, will there be faith on this earth? Have you ever wondered about that question? There is a lot of religion. And many people flock to the church today because of the lust of their eyes and the cravings of their flesh. I want to get a wife. I want to get a husband. I want to have a break, financial breakthrough. This and this and this and this is love of the world. Promoted by who? False teachers. False churches. False preachers. Some call prosperity preachers. That's it here. That's it here. And so the disciples asked Jesus, are many people going to be saved? He says, look, watch out. Make sure you go through the narrow gate. Because wide is the gate that leads to destruction. The world. Because it appeals to your flesh, to your eyes, to your desires. So, in summary here, love of the world is equal to not loving the Father, irrespective of however religious you are. You could be a preacher. You could be the holy of holy people. But if your eyes, if, you, if the cravings of your sinful nature are not under self-control, if the lust of your eyes is not under control, if the boasting of what great job and what this, what this, what this, what this, what this, what car and so on you have, You love the world. You don't love God. Now I'm working on this verse here. 1 John chapter 2, verses 15 to 17. I picked up my Bible dictionary. The New Bible Dictionary says this about love of the world. It says two dominant characteristics of this world the sinful system are pride and covetousness. Pride and covetousness. And as man tends in effect to worship what he covets, such covetousness is idolatry. Accordingly, worldliness is the enthronement of something other than God as the supreme object of man's interest and affections, pleasures and occupations, not necessarily, listen carefully, pleasures and occupations, not necessarily wrong in themselves, become so when all absorbing attention is paid to them. There is nothing wrong in and of itself. What's wrong is your heart and your attitude towards those things. Matthew chapter 6 verse 33. Seek first the kingdom of God, not these things. And all these things will be added unto you. And much of these things are not going to be added to you in this life. It's in the life to come. Yes, there is an eternal life, people. You will live again. But if you live for the world now, you will live in destruction. But if you hate the world now, you will live in eternal bliss, eternal pleasures forevermore before God.
So that was almost one page of my notes here, just on this world, that which is, and I'll go back and review it, that which is hostile to God, that which is lost in sin, that which is wholly at odds with anything divine, ruin, and is depraved. This world it lives in opposition to God. Satan is the ruler over this world. But take hope, we are fighting in victory, not for victory, because Christ has already overcome this world. This world hates Jesus. There's a specific way to which, how you should relate to this world, crucified to the world. You don't belong to the world. Keep yourself unpotted by the world. Don't be a friend of the world. Say no to worldly desires. You must overcome the world. And don't love the world. Love of the world is the cravings of sinful man. The loss of his eyes. And the pride of what you have and you do. If you do not understand these things, you can write me in private and say, but how exactly does this, this, and this relate to this? Then sometimes the word appears, worldliness. Worldliness. And the definition of worldliness is related specifically to how you dress. Yes. How you dress matters a lot spiritually. How you dress matters a lot spiritually. Worldliness. Adorning. Adornment. Ornament. Adorning. Adornment. Ornament. What you put up in your, in your body defines you as worldly or godly. 1 Peter 3.3 3. 1 Peter 3.3 3. It says this, Your beauty should not come from outward adornment or should not come from worldliness, such as braided hair and the wearing of gold jewelry and other fine clothes. Speaking specifically here to women, men not excluded, because men also are very flamboyant, and they know what to do and to wear in order to cause distraction in the crowd of women. And it's the same thing to women that is being said here. So worldliness here is defined as adorning, adornment, ornament. It has to do with dressing, dressing up what you put up on your body which is inappropriate, which is seductive, or as you say in the West, which is sexy. The Bible defines it that if you dress inappropriately, wear clothes that tends to define your female anatomy in open, in tight-fitting pants, in short skirts, if you dress like the world to be sexy, the right word for sexy is actually seductive. The Bible says you are dressed like a harlot, like a prostitute. It does not matter whether people pay you for money for sex or not. If you dress like that, you are a prostitute. It doesn't matter if you dress like that and go to church. It's only worse off. You're going to understand why. In fact, before we read it, if you dress like that, if you intentionally dress up seductively, sexy, in order to appeal and attract men, the Bible says that you are an agent of Satan. You are a trap catching men for hell. Irrespective of whether you dress and you go to church. You are a satanic agent. It's not a ghost whispering somewhere. It's not some whispering demon. When you dress seductively, you are a satanic agent. Trapping men to hell. Let's turn to Proverbs chapter 7. 
Proverbs chapter 7. We could have read the whole thing, but I'm just going to read verses 6 to 12 and 26 to 27. Once more, I said, if you dress intentionally sexy, you're dressing seductive, you're dressing like an harlot, you are an agent of Satan catching men for hell. 7 verse 6 to 12. The wise man says, At the window of my house, window of my house, I look through the lattice, see through hole. I saw among the simple, that's gullible, I noticed among the young men a youth who lacked judgment. He was going down the street near her corner. Who is the her? Walking along in the direction of her house. At twilight, as the day was fading, as the day was fading, this may be ancient, 2,800 years ago, but go to our streets. Go to Las Vegas. Go to Hollywood. You see this at the fading of the day. Who is lurking in the dark? At twilight, at the fading of the day, as the dark set in, then came out a woman to meet him, dressed like a prostitute and with crafty intent. When you dress seductively, when you dress sexy, exposing your inner body, which you call private, which you expose and it becomes public, you, when you dress like this, you have a crafty intent to catch men. She is loud and defiant. Her feet never stay at home. Now in the street, now in the squares, at every corner, she looks. Yes. My sisters, I have to be plain to you. When you dress like that, when you stand in front of the mirror, and you're not just looking at yourself dressed appropriately, but dressing in a way to be recognized, dressing to be seductive, you are an agent of Satan. Remember, this woman here, she's a married woman. She's not a paid prostitute. So even as a married woman, you can dress like a prostitute, exposing yourself beyond what should be exposed. And may I remind you that if you are catching men for hell, you're also going to hell. There's not going to be a piece of cloth in hell. You want to walk naked? We are going to send you to a place where you can walk naked eternally. Absolutely. So, what is my rationale for saying that when you dress seductively, you are an agent of Satan? Let's go down for to verse 26 to verse 27. Verse 26 says, Many are the victims she has brought down. Many men have been brought down to the grave and to, to hell by your seductive dressing. My sister has slain a, a mighty throng. You slain men. Yes. Her house is a highway to the, to the grave. Or oh, her house is a highway to hell. The woman who dresses seductively is a highway to hell. That is the Bible. You either believe it and then live accordingly and dress accordingly or you reject it and continue to be an agent of hell. Leading down to the chambers of death. It is that serious. The way your attire is that serious to the Bible. And it's treated in multiple places. I've read just 1 Peter 3.3 3 and Proverbs chapter 7.
How, so, so the question is, how does the world dress? It dresses seductively. It dresses sexy in order to catch men. It dresses with a crafty intent. You cannot tell me that you are leaving your house with your breast exposed, wearing a short skirt, and you don't have a crafty intent in you. It's not a holy intent. You are worldly. That is worldliness. What we are seeing here is that, in fact, worldliness, how you dress, is the primary definition of world in the Bible reference books. Yes. I'll read what I wrote here. Yes, sisters, exposing your breasts and tight clothing, mini skirts and pants, slits up your skirts and up to your thighs. If you can't wear it before the king of kings, God, don't wear it anywhere outside of your house. You really think that you can walk up to God exposing your breast like God doesn't know how your breast look like? Or do you have the best breast in the world that everybody has to see? Don't be an agent of Satan. It's, it's serious. Of course. The Bible says that the way to hell is wide and everybody goes thereby. Follow the world and how it dresses unto hell you go. And not only going to hell, you are an agent of Satan. If you can't wear it before God, don't wear it outside of your house. After all, where is God? When are you supposed to be holy? Only when you are outside? Or only when you go to church? Don't deceive yourself. The next meaning we're going to look at here and round up is this world will be judged and it will pass away and give way to a new world, to a new age. God will redeem this world. This world will be brought under the feet of Jesus. And if you are not under Jesus, then you are heading to destruction, not to the new world. This will... This, this world, as you see it now, I said, this will, it, it will become a new world, a new age, subject to Christ and subject to believers. And the new world will be the kingdoms that are now taken over by Christ. In Revelation 11, 15, it says that when the seven angels sounded his trumpet, there were loud voices in heaven who shouted, the kingdoms of this world have become the kingdoms of Christ and of his God. And he will reign forever and ever. Only with those who now are suffering or walking the narrow path with him. You will roam with him. The parable of the weeds in Matthew chapter 13, 24 to 30. And I will plead with you. I'm not going to read this passages here, to go and read Matthew chapter 13. It shows us that the kingdom of God will be this world with all the evil people and the evil systems removed. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth, the world, as we see it right now. And it's going to be a world without end. And I, lastly, as I started, what is meant by in the world, but not of the world? I hope I've tried to answer that question to you. And lastly, I'll read that verse to you. John, 1 John 2, 15 to 17. Do not love the world or anything in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For everything in the world, the cravings of sinful men, the lust of the eyes, and the boasting of what he has and does, comes not from the Father, but from the world. The world and his desires pass away, but the man who does the will of God lives forever. Amen.